One. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I loved exploring creepy places. A few of us had our driver's license, so on weekend nights, we would gather a group of six to ten people and go on an adventure. One summer, our favorite place to go was this abandoned movie theater on the west end of town. This place had closed down probably about three years before we started visiting it, and in that time, it had become a rundown building. There were no trespassing signs on the front entrance and each of the fire exits around the building, coming from the theater rooms. The glass at the main entrance was all broken and had been boarded up. The front door was busted and didn't latch or lock so people were able to get inside. We knew there had to be homeless people crashing in there, but we were young and dumb and felt invincible in a group. It was part of what made it scary. We would always wait until between 11pm and 2am to go into places like this, because we didn't want anyone to see or hear us and report us to the police. We all explored it together the first two times we went in. The screens and seats were all torn up inside each of the maybe eight rooms. The bathroom mirrors were broken, and there was graffiti everywhere. We were fairly sure there were people hiding in there while we were inside. Even if we never saw anyone the first two times we went, there were a couple of shopping carts from a nearby Fred Meyer inside, with cans and bottles in them, and a few dirty blankets scattered around in different rooms. It looked lived in. After getting to know the layout of the place the first couple trips, we made a game of it for the third and final visit. This time the six of us that went in split into three groups of two, and with our partner the two of us would enter the front together and spend a full five minutes inside while the others waited outside at our chosen exit in the back of the building. The first two, Beck and Doug, both went in while we waited outside. About seven minutes went by and just as we were starting to worry that we should go in after them, they made it out to the other side through the fire exit. Doug told us that they went upstairs into the office and there was a sleeping bag that hadn't been there on the last visit, and as soon as they went up and saw it, they tried to leave immediately, but they got turned around and tried to leave through the wrong exit, which was sealed shut. They were paranoid that they were being followed out, so they just stood there watching the way they entered the theater room for a minute, making sure that they didn't hear any noises, before they finally worked up the nerve to run out the correct exit in the room across the hallway. Doug and Beck both wanted us all to leave, but Jack and I weren't having any of that and insisted on going in. Brad and Drew, the other group of two that was going to go in last, wanted to come with us. So the four of us went inside while Beck and Doug both waited by the exit. The first thing we all wanted to do when we got inside was go check out the upstairs office. Just as we started to make our way upstairs, we all heard a loud banging sound. It was coming from the back of the theater. We all agreed it had to be Beck and Doug trying to scare us so that we would come out and we could leave. We got upstairs and the pounding stopped. Doug was right. There was a sleeping bag rolled out on the ground with a few paper bags set up around it. Brad flashed a light in one of them and saw a syringe in something that looked like a vibrator. We were all pretty grossed out and had a little laugh about it. We looked around up there and didn't really notice anything else interesting, and we were starting back downstairs when the pounding started again. We decided we should probably make our way to the exit. I hoped we hadn't been caught trespassing by the police. We came out through the exit, and immediately both Doug and Beck were talking over themselves to tell us that about a minute after we entered the theater, a really tall, creepy, homeless-looking man with greasy hair walked right past them, heading for the entrance. Beck said hello as he passed, and the guy stopped, turned and kind of lunged a few inches toward him before stopping. One side of his face was really wrinkly. Beck thinks maybe he was a burn victim or something. The guy stared him down for a second, and then, without saying anything, turned and walked around the corner where he had gone inside. They started pounding on the door right after he was out of sight to try and warn us that there was a scary dude in there with us. We were in there for about five minutes with this guy, and we never saw him. He had to have heard us and hid somewhere. We started to walk back to our car in the Fred Mayer parking lot, about a hundred yards away from the theater, and a car pulled into the parking lot and shined its headlights on us, before flashing its red and blues. The officer told us all to sit down in front of the spotlight in front of his car, and asked us what we were doing. 
We told him we were going to head inside the movie theater, but a really scary tall guy walked in and we chickened out. He told us that it was really dangerous to go into places like this, and there had been violence in the building before, and it'd be a shame if we got hurt doing something stupid. He let us go, and as we drove off, we saw him shining a light inside the front entrance. We took the nice police officer's advice and never went into places like this again. I never did find out what violence he was talking about, it could have just been a tactic to scare us out of coming back. We stuck to graveyards and cemeteries after this. Creepy dude that lives in condemned buildings, I'm glad I never actually met you. But thank you for getting me out of a ticket for trespassing. And thanks to everyone else hiding in the building for not assaulting myself or my friends. 2. I am an 18 year old female security guard and weigh about 125 pounds. This is important to note. I started this job a little over half a year ago now and have had some crazy experiences. But I also think that's what makes me love it so much. There's never a dull moment while in uniform. So basically I work for a security company who then gets hired from other businesses, large events, etc. I have worked all over, but because I recently started college, I have cut my hours more than in half. Because of this, I also decided to stick to one location every weekend to make life a little bit more simple. For the past three or so months, this location I have been working has been a public library, a few cities away from my own. When I got this assignment, I couldn't help but laugh and think a library really needs a security guard, but soon found out, yes, they sure do. This library is in a quote-unquote ghetto part of town, with a high crime rate as well as a high rate of homelessness. That being said, I have a lot of interesting stories, but we'll stick to just one today. So, a little over a month ago, a man in his late 30s came up to me, and asked if the library had any bags for sale. For visualization purposes, he was a tall, lanky man who had a slight limp. I sat quiet for a minute, trying to figure out why this guy came to the library for anything other than a book, as he cut my thoughts off and said, I'm homeless, and I'm just trying to find a cheap bag to carry my cosmetics. I told him I was unsure and would go ask management. I went upstairs to ask if I could purchase him one, simply just to be a good person, and received a hard no. I was furious and disappointed in humanity, but I'm now thanking God I received that answer. I went back downstairs and found the man, telling him we were unable to help him. I was in a very emotional state because I was extremely heartbroken and felt I was unable to do the right thing. This is where his obsession began. He mistakenly took my kindness as a sign of interest in him. After that, he showed up every weekend. I worked every Saturday and Sunday for the past month, and we have a 15 to 20 minute conversation each time. At the time, I didn't find anything to be strange about those conversations, but thinking back now, there's a few. Firstly, I recall two times when he asked me where I live, both times receiving the answer of, I'm not from around here, and being about the college I attend. When we met, where I went to school was one of the first things he asked me, which personally I don't think is a strange question, I get it all the time, I never thought there would be an issue for answering it. So I did just that. He responded by saying, no way I do too. I just have to drop out though because I'm having financial issues. This lined up with his story so I believed it. A few weeks passed and he came back to telling me that he would be coming back to my school for the spring semester and he would look for me. I felt a little uncomfortable about this, something just struck me the wrong way about how he worded it. But with that being said, he was a very kind man, so I brushed it off. Recently, about two weekends ago, I was sitting towards the back of the library on my phone. I'm allowed to be on my phone as long as I'm taking laps every once in a while and still staying aware of what's going on. So, as usual, I looked up and scanned the area to do just that. I looked back and forth and finally all the way to my left. I noticed that the man I'd been talking to was sitting a little ways down but still behind me. He was slouched in his seat, body facing me, staring. Even as I began to stare back to him in confusion, he refused to look away. I got very uncomfortable and my stomach dropped. I believe so strongly in gut instincts. And as my pulse rose, I grabbed my stuff and began to walk back to my office. When I finally got back, I hurried to open the security cameras, rewinding a few minutes, and saw him sitting there, non-stop, 
staring at me. I didn't know this while it was happening, but as I stood up, he did too. As I walked to my office, he did too. I even noticed at one point he stopped behind some bookshelves to see which direction I was going. I pushed live to see what he was now doing. And he was sitting on a couch right outside my office. He sat there for five to ten minutes. But when I didn't come out, he left. I should also mention that I watched every single minute of the thirty minutes he was there, and my findings freaked me out even more. In those 30 minutes, he never once looked at a book, magazine, computer, or anything. It was almost as if he was there just to see me. The next day, Sunday, I saw him walk in and immediately walked to my office before he could notice me. I watched him on the cameras as he paced back and forth, doing about five laps around our very large library. He again never once looked at a book, but instead was clearly looking for me as he turned his head back and forth while doing laps. When he couldn't find me, he left. I felt very uncomfortable and went to about four different supervisors and none of them took me seriously. Considering I am the one who is supposed to deal with issues like that, finally I went to my boss who was a current police officer in that city, and he was very concerned. He pulled his records and we found things I was not even close to being mentally prepared for. I felt as if we were scrolling through entire pages of things he'd done, the first being him doing this to multiple other women in different forms. That's the nicest way I can put it. He had two open cases for this. One being at my college at the beginning of this semester. When I say I was horrified, I genuinely have never felt that way before in my life. He also had a few charges for battery as well. Telling me that the kind man I knew was actually an aggressive, manipulative man. Who was playing me so hard. If I do say so myself, it worked. He obviously had many other charges, but none of those connect to my situation. I also found out two more things. First being that he was in the highest security prison in my entire state, where our most dangerous criminals go according to their website. Second, possibly being the worst find of them all, my boss told me that in 2010 he had stalked another female employee at the library, and was temporarily banned. He not only stalked her at work, but took it as far as to stalk her and follow her outside of work. Which, now knowing all this information and working with the police regularly at my job, I definitely let them in on what went on. I also wrote up a report to get him banned from the library yet again, but that typically takes a while and even after that, I'm not sure how long he will be banned for because it's always different. Through all of my overthinking, I began putting some pieces together. When he told me he was homeless, he wasn't lying but he was in fact homeless because he had just gotten out of prison. When he told me he dropped out of my college, sure, he wasn't lying, but he forgot to mention that it was because he messed with a young girl. Long story short, be very aware of your surroundings, because in this situation I wasn't. I don't even want to think about what could have happened to me. Oh, and always trust your gut, because you'd rather be safe than sorry. So to the man who stalked and manipulated me, please let's not ever meet again. 3. After reading the fascinating accounts of stalking and creep stories, I was moved to explore what factors might create a stalker and creep. Here's my case study. Middle-aged female creeper here, Boku Creep Experience. I might offer a bit of insight as to how I went down this wrong path. My dad was a large, very dominating presence. His word was absolute law, and you could be hit or verbally belittled during any discourse with him. To him, every thought I had was incorrect just because it was mine. Any social situation that went awry, I was always at fault just because I was me. I was told to shut up and follow other people regardless of whether what they were engaged in was worthwhile or not. My questions were met with, none of your business, or you don't know what you're talking about. I was kicked up the stairs and hit in the face repeatedly by him, once about twenty times in a row. After divorce from my mom, he paid the barest minimum in child support. My mom did not want to get a real job, we kids went to school in soiled, ragged clothes, of which we had very few. Classmates taunted me. I was the dirty girl at school that nobody liked. People would yell, Take a bath with soap tonight! Or some such. 
I even had a bully that would ride by on his bicycle and try to rip out my hair or just flat try to run me down. He and his friends ambushed me and he hit me in the face with a book and threw all my stuff around the street. My loud mom developed a very strange need to be the center of attention. What few friends I did have she would monopolize when I had over, like she was competing with me for them. She asked one girl to spend the night. That friend said to me, It's kind of weird. I never had someone's mom ask me to sleep over before. At the school, mom would smoke, go braless, and be the loudest parent on the scene, like she wanted everyone to look at her. Then she would mock me for not having enough friends, while I stood there humiliated in my filthy clothes. By my mid-teens, I was about mute outside of the very few friends I was used to. I was physically unattractive to boot, so could not make the dating scene. However, I did develop teenage crushes. I knew I had no chance with these guys, but I wanted to be in their orb somehow. My friends would help me case their residences, we would go into the woods behind their homes at night and watch the goings-on through their windows. We'd see family members peering outside the windows trying to determine what was afoot on their lawns. Since we had darkness on our side, we were never spotted. It must have been very unsettling for them. We spied on at least three different guys for me, and even put letters in some of the mailboxes. I checked out their workplaces and scanned for their cars. I can't put a number on how many hang-up phone calls I did, just to hear their voices. This was before stalking became a thing. I knew I was guilty of trespassing, but back then I looked up on forays onto other people's private property as no more serious than a parking violation. It took me many years before I totally got the importance of respecting others' personal space, due to my boundaries having been breached by my father's physical abuse and domination, my mom with her invasions into my social relationships, and bullies encroaching on me physically and emotionally. I really was that clueless. Plus the years of rejection due to my involuntary lack of personal hygiene and shabby garments left me literally no social abilities. My creepy behavior continued into college. I had to move out of the dorm due to my roommates being put off by my creep aura. I kept making the mistakes of being needy, clingy, and oversharing. I was so intimidated I was stone silent on some days. I tried an apartment with some add-on roommates. One found my constant presence so cringy she told me I was like a pet dog because I was always home. Finally I took to living alone. I fell in love with the autonomy and freedom from the looks askance I used to glean due to my non-existent social life. Oddly, I never felt bored or lonely, just liberated with plenty of choice, loads of peace of mind. In fact, I was pretty happy, and good on staying permanently single since I had long given up the idea of marrying. The only problem I had was I still wanted a baby, and my creep factor remained an obstacle. I tried to sign on at a sperm bank that would serve as single women. I had passed all of the physical tests and went on to the interview with her psychiatrist. I guess her creep radar went off and she told me outright that she would recommend against the clinic signing me on as a client without giving me a clear reason. I was devastated and considered suicide. Then I dusted myself off and sallied forth. After six years of non-stop shoulder to wheel I became a mom by the traditional path and have several children. Determined for them to live a normal life, I made darn sure they were well-groomed with plenty of clean, attractive clothes. I set the example of being well-behaved and reserved in public. I made it a point to stay out of their social lives unless there was a strong reason for me to get involved. There seldom was. I think this somewhat hands-off approach I took towards their friendships paid off for them. Today, they are older teenagers with good relationship skills. Light years better than mine. Jobs and in college. High grades, never get in trouble with drugs, drinking, or the law. Unfortunately, I still think I give off a creep vibe to most other parents. There have only been a handful of times when another woman invited me and the kids for fun time with her and her children. I had really hoped for lots of this mommy camaraderie with other moms, and I'm a bit sad that I barely got to enjoy any. Most other parents seem to welcome my kids to hang with theirs, as long as the weirdo mom, me, kept my distance. Yep, still a member of the creep set after all these years. But at least I no longer act out in full creep mode. I have given up the yard, business, vehicle, and phone surveillance I carried out as an obsessive teen. 
I truly am sorry that I peeped in windows and stopped. My people skills are probably only about 70% of a normal person on my best days, so I have come a good ways from the absolute zero I stood at as a young adult. But maybe, most importantly, my respect of others' boundaries is now solid. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, Hellfraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 457. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Well, I thought the last story there was quite interesting indeed. Always like to be able to include those little alternate perspective ones. That's not to say that there's a universal explanation as to why all creepy people act like creepy people. Some people are just messed up without reason. But now and again, there is a reason, and people can change. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.